garden. And of course, they had just slain all of those rebels in the camp who would not relent and release their idol worship of the calf. And tonight we start at number seven, plagued. It says in verse number 33a, uh, uh, let's look at the back of 113 first. God, this is who it's talking about here, says, Thou art of purer eyes than to behold evil and canst not look on iniquity. That describes God. God cannot look upon sin. Sin cannot come into God's presence. God must and will deal with all sin. Sin cannot come into the presence of the Lord without being totally obliterated and destroyed. In the lost world and in the saved world alike, when we as Christians harbor sin in our lives, we are causing ourselves being alienated from God. God didn't alienate himself. We alienated ourselves by choosing to play with sin. Now verse 33 is the verdict. And the Lord said unto Moses, Whosoever hath sinned against me, him will I blot out of my book. Now, you've got to understand there are two different books in heaven. And God deals with sin personally, one on one. Notice God made it clear they sinned against God and God alone. It says, whomsoever has sinned against me. Let me tell you something, folks. When you sin, you're hurting God. You're not just hurting yourself. You are hurting yourself, but you're not just hurting yourself. And you're hurting others, but you're hurting God most of all, the one who loved and gave his life for you. Psalm 51, 4 says, against thee and thee only have I sinned, David said, after Nathan had got in his face. And uh, Nathan told him the story about somebody killing somebody's pet lamb and David got all upset. And he said, man, that guy ought to have to pay. And Nathan pointed his finger and says, thou art the man. And David's heart melted and David was under conviction. And he said that thou mayest be justified when thou speakest and be clear when thou judgest. Tonight, God's going to speak to you about things in your life. Are you going to listen? God's going to judge things in your life tonight. Are we going to listen? We have to listen. If we're going to learn, we have to listen. We're going to live, we've got to listen. We're going to love, we've got to listen. And it's important that we do that. If these Israelites did not repent from idolatry, they were going to have a rough, rough existence for all of eternity. There were thousands of people following Moses in Israel. Even though they were following along with the children of Israel, didn't believe in Jehovah God and didn't trust him. They'd rather worship an idol than worship the true and living God. That's the danger here. This is not losing your salvation. You've got some people who try to twist this passage and say, see, God will take your salvation away. No, they never had any to start with. They never had any faith to start with. You can't take something away from somebody they don't have. And they didn't have faith. That's why they were falling after this calf and worshiping this calf. So we're not talking about believers. We're talking about unbelievers here. And there's a difference between the book of life and the Lamb's book of life. When you're born, your name is written in the Lamb's book of life. It's a hope book. God writes your name there. It's like his prayer list, his hope book that you'll come to know him before you die. And if you die without Christ, your name is removed from the book of life. Now, if you accept Christ while you're living, your name is written in the Lamb's book of life. And when you die, if your name's in the Lamb's book of life, it gets to stay in the book of life. So being saved is an important thing. Say amen. Knowing Christ is an important thing. Being born again is an important decision. And so... Um, if you die and you do not accept Christ's finished work on the cross of Calvary, then your name is blotted out of the book of life because all hope is lost at that point. When you die without Christ, all hope is lost. That's why life is so important. That's why living is so important to give us every opportunity and every chance to be born again, to be saved. And the greatest sin in the eyes of God Almighty is the rejection of the love that he gave you by sending his son to die on the cross, his only begotten son. The verdict for the unbeliever, 
hell for all of eternity. Separation from God forever. That's the verdict. Now, B, visit, verse 34. Therefore now go and lead the people unto the place which I have spoken. All right, judgments come. All the unbelievers have been abolished. Now they're hopefully just believers, just followers, people who are wanting to go to the promised land, believe God to go there. And he says, take them to the place which I have spoken unto thee. Behold, circle this in your notes and in your Bible, mine angel. Now here's where the test starts, the test for the believer. Once you get saved, I can guarantee you the next thing that's gonna happen to you is you're gonna be tested. Your faith is gonna be tested. Do you truly believe? And here we see him say, I'm gonna send an angel. Now this is not a test of sin or temptation. This is a test that God is trying to say, do you really want me? Do you really love me? You get married and that husband marries that wife and stands in front of that congregation and pledges his love till death do you part. But that old story Jerry Clower tells just ain't true. Y'all heard that story Jerry Clower tells? Some of y'all look like you need a little joke here. The old man and the old woman sitting in the car together. She commences to cry and he said, what's wrong with you? You don't ever tell me you love me no more. He stops for a minute and he says, well, he said, I told you on the day I married you, I loved you. If anything changed, I'd tell you. It don't work like that, does it, newlywed? Now, see, she's, she's agreeing with me that. It don't work that way. She wants to hear him say every day, I love you. She wants him to show her every day, he loves her. And before you say, that's ishy gushy, hey, God expects the same thing from you. <whistles> Temperature just changed, didn't it, huh? Now it's pointing at all of us, isn't it? God wants to hear us say every day, I love you. He wants us to see, he wants to see in our lives actions that say I love you. Now, it's important to understand that as we go forward. It says, shall go, this angel shall go before thee. Nevertheless, in the day when I visit, I will visit their sin upon them. Now, that's a complicated statement. And I'll get into it as, as, as clearly as I can. But what the Lord is actually saying here in this little section of th verse 34 is, I can't go with you because I might get mad at you. <laughs> now, God is playing with them. He's playing with Moses. He's playing with Israel. He's, he's telling the truth, though. If they make him mad, he can chastise them. Amen? But he's wanting to hear something out of them. With that statement, he's testing their faith. And God said to Moses, now move on forward to the promised land. Those who have repented from their idolatry, I've forgiven them, I've restored them, I'm gonna send my angel to lead them. And those who have not, their sins are gonna be dealt with. But look at Hebrews 10, 29. Of how much sore punishment, suppose ye, shall he be thought worthy who hath trodden under the foot the Son of God, that's Jesus, and hath counted the blood of his covenant Blood, I think it was Jamie was in my office today telling me when they put Jesus down that pit to hold him overnight that evidently his blood was put on the wall of that pit. And you know they can't get it off? They can't get his, aren't you glad his blood is hard to remove? That ought to make you shout if you got any God in you at all. The blood's still there, amen? And if he places it on your heart, man, I love that song, Smokey Sang Sunday. Is his blood on your hand or is it in your heart? I want it in my heart, amen? That's where I put his blood. I don't want it on my hand. I want it in my heart. Then it says, wherewith he was sanctified, uh, I counted worthy of the blood that come, wherewith he was sanctified, an unholy thing, and hath done despite unto the spirit of grace. When you start wanting to go back to the old life and go back to the old way, you're fighting the spirit of grace. It's a losing battle. It's a losing battle. You can try to go back to the old life. You can even go back there, but you're not going to live to talk about it. I can promise you. You're not. And so it's not worth it to go back and fight grace because it's a losing battle. 
Yielding to grace is a winning battle. Grace is God's riches at Christ's expense. That's the fact the Holy Spirit lives in you. When you yield to the Holy Spirit of God, God can lead you, guide you, direct you, protect you, and affect you. That's pretty good. Off the top of my head, say amen. Now, he said in verse 30, For we know him that hath said, the Lord, Vengeance belongeth unto me, I will recompense, saith the Lord. And again, the Lord shall judge his people. Now look, we're not to judge each other. That's God's job. We're to love each other. Yeah, but you don't know what so-and-so, I don't give a flip nickel what so-and-so did. I don't care what they done. You're not a judge. You're a servant. And you're supposed to love your brothers and sisters in Christ and encourage them and lift them up, not stomp on them, not jump on them. It's important we understand that we're supposed to love. It is a fearful thing, listen to this, to fall into the hands of the what? Living God. I've heard so many people quote that wrong. Let me tell you how they quote it. It's a fearful thing to fall in the hands of an angry God. That's not what the Bible says. The Bible says it's a, it is a fearful thing to fall in the hands of the living God. Do you know why that word living is so important and not put anger there? He rose from the dead. He died, was buried, and rose again for you. He gave everything he had for you. And if you thwart that love, then he's going to be pretty upset. Have you ever done something nice for somebody and you just knew they were going to be thrilled to death and they didn't even thank you for it? We've all been there. I've done it several times. Make me so mad, I say, I ain't doing nothing else for them. I'm through with them. Now, we're not supposed to be that way, and God's not going to be that way until the end. When you finally made that final decision, you're not going to accept Christ as your Lord and Savior. He's going to blow his top. Why? He's got right to then. Why? Because he offered you his life, his life for yours. He wanted to give you his eternal life. He wanted you to live with him forever in heaven. It is a fearful thing to fall into the hands of a living God. He's alive, and he's going to judge things fairly. And he's going to judge things right. Zechariah 7 11. But they refuse to what? Sounds like America. Refuses to listen. And pulled away the shoulder. You ever had to try to reach out to somebody and they pull their shoulder away? That's what this verse is pointing. It's saying God's reaching out and you're just jerking your shoulder away from him. You don't want to listen to him. Then it says, and stop their ears. Oh, how many times I've talked to my boys and they would do this number. You can talk, but I ain't listening. Stick the fingers in their ears. Matter of fact, Wendy's done it a time or two. She can give me the evil eye back on that. But they stick the fingers in their ears and they don't want to listen. They pull the shoulder away. They stick the fingers in their ears. Then it says, Yea, they made their hearts as adamant stone. Adamant means determined. Stone is hard. Folks, we need soft hearts, not hearts of stone. You say, well, what will make a stony heart soft? The blood of the Lord Jesus Christ. Lest they should hear the law and the words which the Lord of hosts has sent in, in his spirit by the former prophets, that's the Bible, therefore came a great wrath from the Lord of hosts. Folks, you can know the Lord and not listen to him and incur his wrath. It's a serious thing to listen to God and then ignore him. Therefore it come to pass that as he cried, they would not hear. So they, when, so they cried, and I would not hear, saith the Lord. In other words, when he cried to them to help them and they wouldn't listen, when they cried back to him, he stuck his fingers in his ears. He pulled his shoulder away. Why? He reacted just like they reacted. Then it says, but I scattered them with a the whirlwind among the nations whom they knew not. Thus the land was desolate after them. When the Babylonian captivity came, they took them Israelites out of their homeland, destroyed the city of Jerusalem, and spread them Jews out everywhere and turned them into what? Slaves. You know what the devil does? 
The devil comes in, he roots into your life, he pulls you away from God and the house of God and the people of God and puts you back into a pit of sin and he turns you into a slave of sin. And then your life is desolate. I've lived long enough now, I've seen some things. I've lived long enough, I've seen some people's testimonies for a long period of time. And I've known some people who were on fire for God sold out to God and all of a sudden one day they decided to wander off into a path of the wilderness and fall into sin. They got out of the will of God and the work of God and from that point on I can honestly say their life when it comes to spiritual things was as dry as the desert, as unproductive as the desert, as deadly as the desert because they walked away from God. Folks, we can't afford to walk away from God. Say amen. That no man passed through, nor what? Return. Let me tell you something. The greatest story ever told in the New Testament, I think, is the prodigal son. Because the prodigal wandered away, joined himself to another country, started living in a pig pen, eating the husk which the, the hogs were fed. He was eating food the animals eat that they weren't even supposed to be around. But he said one day, this is crazy. Man, they got food on my father's table. I got a bed in my father's house. I got clothes in my father's house. I don't have to live like this. I don't need to live like this. And he got out of that pig pen. He'd done the smartest thing he ever did. He did what? He went back home. Started living with his daddy like he used to. And you know what? His daddy said, no, you're only going to be half a son. I'm going to make you a slave. Did he say that? He said, no, kill the fatted calf. Put the robe on him. Put the ring back on his finger. Hey, I'm restoring him just like he never left. Boy, we ought to embrace that. Say amen. Thank God if we mess up, God will bring us back and restore us. But the sad part is we wander away. My job as a pastor is to preach the word of God Sunday morning, Sunday night, Wednesday night, Tuesday, Thursday, to give you all the word of God to prevent you from taking that wondrous path. It's not wondrous, I said wondrous, wandering. And nothing breaks my heart to watch a young Christian or even a mature Christian all of a sudden start backtracking, going back to the way they used to be. Hey, when God matures you to where you're faithful to the house of God, you're faithful to giving to God, you're faithful to serving the Lord, you're faithful to loving the brethren, you're faithful to witnessing to the lost, it's a horrible thing to go backwards. But I see Christians do it every day. And they start slacking up is what it's called. And before they know, they slack up and slack out. And before they know, they're living in the desert instead of the glorious land of God. Hey, I don't want to be in the desert. Amen? I don't want to be where there's no water. It says, for they laid the pleasant land. What? You see, God's got a pleasant land for you. Listen to me. Don't go to sleep on me tonight. Listen to me. God's got a blessed ministry for you. A blessed work for you to do. And I know it gets rough. Lord knows. I, I work with y'all. Y'all work with me. We know it gets rough. Times get tough. Things get hard sometimes. I don't like getting calls mama's dying come to the hospital. I don't like getting calls like that. I don't like getting calls that, that people are sick, and people are hurting. I don't like getting bad news. But it comes. Life is life. Say amen or amen. But in the midst of that, if you stay close to God through the storm, through the hard times, through the rough times, he said, I'll never leave you nor forsake you. I'll put my arms around you. I'll protect you. I'll take care of you. And I'll watch after you. You know, animals aren't crazy. That cat of mine's been upset for three days. He knows the storms are brewing. They can tell. And he's either running to win you, or he's running to me. He wants comfort. He wants to know he's all right. I'm here to tell you, you're all right. I don't care what you're going through. I don't have bad, I don't care how bad it is. If you're financially bankrupt, if your family's run off and left you, if, you're, if the, everything, your health is dropped and gone, I don't care what happens to you. If you're with God, don't worry about it. Don't fret it. Don't get mad at God, get mad at the work of God and wander away and get frustrated and feel sorry for yourself. Focus on the pleasant land ahead. 
It's guaranteed in this life. It's guaranteed in the life to come. God's got something big for you. I have got, this week, I've got more response off eternal broadcast than I've ever got in my life. I told you a preacher called me Sunday, texted me Sunday, and was, was just bragging him, and I needed as bad as the attendance was Sunday, say amen or oh me. I needed that encouragement. He was more burgundy than it was people. And I needed that. And then I come home, and a lady in Georgia sent me an email, just praising God for eternal broadcasting. She was at home. Couldn't get out. She was sick over the weekend. She listened to me preach. I said, well, glory to God. Not that she was sick, but glory to God, she got to listen. And it was a blessing to her. And she was just telling me how much of a blessing, how encouragement it was, how much she learned. See, God's going to get you through the tough times. He never promised they'd be short. Sometimes they're long. And sometimes they're deep and they're tough. But the pleasant land is coming. The pleasant land is coming. Now, I'm going to get to go back and preach this Monday night in the church I first pastored. I can't believe they asked me back. Bless God. I'm going to. I'm going to go back and preach to them. But when I leave there, I'll come back and I'll come to this door and I'll go, I'm glad I'm home. I love Tim Blake Baptist Church. Amen. I'm back in the what? Pleasant land. <laughs> Whoo, God has blessed me. He, he moved me to Danville. Thank God for that. I'll never forget long as I live. I took Brandon and Jason to that church first time on vacation one time. I said, I want y'all to go see where I first preached. And we were there till one o'clock. They learned their daddy wasn't as long-winded as they thought he was. Say amen or oh me. They took three offerings while we was there. My boys looked at me like, what in the world is he doing? And they had a set of drums in that church. All you could hear was wop, 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 wop. So from that point on, we'd say we're going out of town. They'd say, we ain't going to that wop, wop church, are we? <laughs> hey, thank God. He, he, we moved up, amen. We, 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 we're in the pleasant land. But I could have missed those blessings. I could have made some bad decisions. But thank God I didn't. Thank God I stayed faithful. Just thank God I didn't throw in the towel. And we're in the pleasant land. And you can be in the pleasant land. All right, I, I preached too long. Time's running out. Those who did not participate in the worship of the golden calf were going to be led by this angel of the Lord because Moses' intercession on their behalf, he prayed for God to spare the people. And he did. He spared those that repented. And Moses did not give up on God's people. And what did God not do? God did not give up on his people. I don't care how deep your valley I don't care how hard your valley, how hot your valley is. Don't you give up on God. Realize there's an enemy and he'll do anything to keep you out of the pleasant land. He'll do anything to keep you from experiencing God's best. This shows every Christian the importance of intercessory prayer on behalf of others. What we did here tonight was not an investment in futility. It was an investment in eternity. Praying for other people does make a difference. Not just here, but in heaven. Amen? We convince God to listen. Now, see, verse 35. Vindication. And the Lord plagued the people because they made the calf which Aaron made. Now, this is just like that story. Okay? Y'all, any of y'all watch This Is Us? They bounce back and forth from the past to the future, from the future to the past, and back and forth. It drives me nuts. I, can't, I try to keep up with which part's going on. It just drives me crazy. Well, that's where this is going back. He said, Land, the Lord did judge those who worshiped the idol. He did. He did that. He had his vindication on them. Those who took part in the molding of the calf and refused to repent and return to Jehovah God because of their transgression, God did this to remind them and to remember the price for breaking God's sin. Israel never forgot that, I guarantee you. They think about going back and worship a calf. They think, uh-uh, I know what God did back on. I ain't doing that. I ain't making that mistake. He's a jealous God. And there's no slipping or sliding by with God. Every sin must be dealt with by the blood of Christ or retribution of God's wrath. It's your choice. Hebrews 9.22 And almost all things are by the law purged with what? The blood of Christ. Without the shedding of blood, there's no what? Remission. All right, get in your new books, okay? 
We're going to just do the introduction and I'll send you home. Whet your appetite for next week. Exodus chapter 33. In chapter 32, we saw wickedness and sin that resulted from unbelief. We saw God deal with it seriously. And God, listen, I, want you to, I don't want you to think God just, there's no such thing as a white lie or a black lie. There's no such thing as a half a sin or a whole sin. Sin is sin. And whether you think it's a little sin or a lot of sin, God doesn't measure sin by amount. If you cross the line, I don't care what line it is, you've what? Sinned. And God's going to deal with it. So you better deal with it. It's a whole lot easier for you to deal with it than if you let God deal with it. Trust me. Trust me. I've been there. I've had God deal with me. And it don't feel good. It don't feel good. It ain't pleasant. I remember one time my mama told me I'd made a mess. She says, you can deal with it or I can deal with it. I said, what do you mean? She said, you can go ahead and clean it up and I'll forget it. Or I'll whoop you and then you got to clean it up. I said, I think I'll just go clean it up. <laughs> I just go ahead and deal with it. Amen. First Samuel 15, 23. I've preached on this verse a thousand times. For rebellion is as the sin of witchcraft, devil worship. And stubbornness is as iniquity and what? Worshiping somebody else other than God. We just saw them do it. They worshiped that calf. Because thou hast rejected the word of the Lord. I'm going to tell you something. That Bible in your lap is important. That Bible on that screen is important. That Bible written in that book is important. Don't, don't reject the word of God. Trust it. Put your faith in it. And he says, I have rejected thee from being king. Saul lost his kingdom because he didn't listen to God's word. And Saul said unto Samuel, I have sinned, for I have transgressed the commandment of the Lord and thy words because I feared the people and obeyed their voice. Let me say this before I go another step further. You ought to love your family. You ought to love your friends. You ought to love your fellowship. Amen? That's what the Bible says. But if you love your family, and you love your friends, or even your church fellowship, more than you do the Word of God, you're in big trouble. Because your family, your friends, and even your church fellowship sometimes will want you to cross a line you ought not to cross. And if you've crossed that line because they nudge you, going to cost you. God's not going to put up with it. Love your family. Love your friends. Love your fellowship. But don't worship them. Do all you can as long as you don't break that word of God. Don't you break that word of God. Now listen. It says, Now therefore I pray thee pardon my sin and turn again with me that I may worship the Lord. And saying unto Saul, I will not return with thee for thou hast rejected the word of the Lord and the Lord hath what? rejected thee from being king you mean to tell you who the saddest Christian in the world is? one who had it going on for God and slid backwards and lost it all they are the saddest Christians, they're the most bitter, they're the most unforgiving, they're the most frustrated because they rejected what the Lord had for them and did what they wanted to do instead of what God wanted them to do and it cost them the best God had for them. God will take no for an answer. And I don't want to test them and see how far I can push them. Say amen. I don't want to test them. I don't want to try it. We're all sinners, and we all like to sin. There's no exception. We need to see ourselves in the true light of the Word of God. We are still a sinner even though we've been saved by grace, and we have to say no to sin. The children of Israel were in a temporary place. Let me remind you, before you get all wrapped up into this temporary home, you ain't going to be here long. This is just a temporary home. Our home is beyond the blue. We have got to get our sights on the future. 
Sunday, I'm going to start preaching a message on shouting. Don't get nervous. It ain't what you think it is. It ain't at all what you think it is. But we're going to preach on shouting for two or three weeks and teach you what the Bible says shouting is. And the Bible tells you clearly seven messages on shouting and we're going to talk about it. Why? Because we've stopped talking. We've stopped praising God. We've stopped saying amen and praise the Lord. We've stopped telling the gospel. We've stopped reaching out to the lost and we've got to change that. Now I like to hear that. Say amen. That's what you've got to learn to do. That's part of shouting. When you hear the truth, you say amen. And when you're blessed, you say praise the Lord. And when you really get good, you say, hallelujah. Amen. Hey, you verbally let people know that you agree with God. I'm not ashamed to agree with God. Amen. Oh, listen to me. We too are not here forever. We're just passing through. And here in Exodus 33, we see Israel's sins from unbelief have separated them from the God that loves them. What's going to bring them back? Chapter 33 is going to tell you how we get back to God. If we've slipped, if we've wandered, if we've slid away, we sin every day. It's a result of our own doubts, our own qualms, our own reservations, fears, and frustrations. And we have our own failures to believe God like we ought to. And we need to deal with them. How do we deal with them? Well, there's three things in this next chapter that God told Moses had to be done. And if the children of Israel did it, they'd get back to the pleasant land. And folks, I don't know about y'all. I want to get back to that pleasant land. I want to get back to that joy. That Hey, I want us to, when the revival time gets here in November, I want us to run Earl ragged, say amen or oh me. I want us to preach him to death. Earl used to say, I can't handle it at Timberlake. What are you talking about, Earl? And people preach me to death. They listen, they say amen, they follow along, they praise the Lord, they bring people. That's what we got to get back to. Say amen. We can't let the circumstances of this life take the joy of our salvation. Because God, God's been good to us. I mean, he's been good to us. He's blessed us in so many ways. Yeah, we have our trials. We have our tribulations. And, and we have our temptations from the devil. But there is no temptation such as common to man that God hasn't made a way of what? Escape. And there's no trial or test we can't pass. You just got to wait on the Lord and smile anyway. Hey, because as, as a little old black, black preacher said years ago, somebody said, what's your favorite? He said, come pass. <laughs> Didn't come stay. It come to pass. Hey, the, the problems pass and the truth comes to fruition. Say amen. So both ways that's true. It come to pass means the truth come to pass, but it also meant the trouble went to pass. It got out of the way. But the sad thing is, people who don't believe God, it never comes to pass. Either way. The storm never goes away. And the truth never comes to fruition. Because we choose to be melancholy. I'll never forget years ago. I was just a probably six or seven year old boy. And my mama and daddy love country music better than a hog love slob. And that brand new 45 record come out by Lynn Anderson. And that tells you how old I am. Some of y'all say, who's Lynn Anderson? If you old, you know who Lynn Anderson was. She says, she had a song called, I Beg Your Part. I Never Promised You a Rose Garden. Along with the sunshine, there's got to be a little rain sometime. If you take, you got to give and live and let live or let go. Whoa, 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 I beg your pardon. I never promised you a what? A rose garden, amen? God has never promised you a rose garden, but he promised to go with you. Love shouldn't be so, what was that song? How many y'all know? Oh, come on, help me. Melon, who said that? I'm going to pray for you, you backslid. <laughs> you know the song is that. Why should love be so melancholy? That means sad. You see, I grew up liking them sad songs. And it'll kill you. I mean, you listen to them sad songs, they'll kill you. You'll be crying with them. First time I heard George Jones sing, uh, He Stopped Loving Her Today, I cried for three weeks. <laughs> Went out and bought two copies of the wreck and wore them slam out. I mean, just melancholy. 
We don't need that kind of junk. Say amen or amen. The devil's got all that melancholy out there to get you to cry and get you upset. Then you solve yourself. Get away from the devil, amen? Don't be melancholy. Well, the story was, I, I, I wrote every word of that song down on a piece of paper seven years old. When I got to the word melancholy, I didn't know how to spell it, and I didn't know what it meant. So I got a dictionary out, and I pulled that dictionary out and looked up melancholy. It said, sad and downcast, loving being sad. I don't like to be sad. I like to be glad, amen? So I learned seven years old what melancholy meant. And folks, we don't need to be melancholy. Yeah, you got problems. My bank account looks like an elephant done stepped on it. Built a deck, bought a car, and now I'm busted. I'm broke. I sing like that old song, I'm broke, busted, you know. Got sad times. I'm having to eat sandwiches instead of at home instead of at the restaurant. Amen. That's part of it. You got hard times. I got a pasta pass and I can't eat the spaghetti. Them's hard times, folks. Huh? All I'm going to get to eat the spaghetti. I got to look at the No, no. I got to eat the salad. Not the spaghetti. I got to eat salad. Yeah. You know, got a pasta pass. Can't eat. Hey, but you got to live through it. Say amen or oh man. Hey, God, I want to be happy. I want y'all to be happy. I want to have a good time. Why? Because better days is coming. Better days is coming. It's going to come to pass. I promise you. Every head's bowed. Every eye's closed.